Welcome to another edition of the Corner Booth Podcast here at Green Spot Restaurant. I'm Aaron Rand along with Leslie Chesterman and Bill Brownstein and our special guest today, Philip Fournier, political analyst from 338Canada.com. And just before we begin, thanks to our sponsors for making this all possible, National Carpet, Guaranteed Industries, and Empire Gold. <laughs> So, Philip, thank you for being here. Thanks for the invitation. Right away, let's jump in. We had a debate <laughs> last night. I wanted us to give, uh, give us your analysis of what you heard and saw last night. Well, the expectations is always what matters in those debates. Uh, Monsieur Legault could very well win with a tie. And I think that's what we saw. Monsieur Legault was a bit more aggressive, but he doesn't need to crush his opponents because he has such a, you know, a massive lead in the polls, especially outside of Montreal. And so uh, I, I think he's going to come out of this mostly unscathed. Uh, Nadeau Dubois and uh, Monsieur Plamondon did fine, but they're also fighting for the same chunk of, uh, of the electorate. So we'll have to wait and see if it moves in the next few days. Madame Adelaide was... I think she was okay, it's just that her numbers are so horrible right now that there's only one way it could go up, or could it? Uh, and as Monsieur Duhem, well, his base is in Quebec City, and you could clearly see that he was talking to those people. He's not really leading a national campaign right now, he's focusing on Quebec City. So, so I want to just ask, with respect to polling, because right. you analyze this, right. from the beginning, this election, as you mentioned, uh, the CAC was miles ahead. It was a foregone conclusion they were going to win. The question was, how big will the win be? And I'm wondering now, have you ever seen a situation in a provincial political race where a party has been this far ahead with just a couple of weeks left to go where it didn't turn out to be what the polls are telling us this one will? Very short answer, no. We, we haven't seen a party lead by that much so close to the election and then lose, even with a polling error, which happens from time to time. Uh, we haven't seen this. So it's not that it's impossible. But we have no precedent for such a, a drop. Like the, the CQ wouldn't need to shed 15 points in the last 10 days, and somebody in the opposition parties would have to pick it up. And right now, the opposition is split almost even four ways. I mean, the latest poll that we saw had the, the conservative, liberal, uh, Quebec Solidaire at 16, and the PQ at 13. So it's a quadruple tie for second place. Uh, we haven't seen this ever uh, in Quebec. So who's number two? In seats or in votes? Both. In seats, it should be the Liberals, but it's not a slap dunk. Uh, if that non-Francophone or Anglophone vote for the Liberals is as soft as, so, as some posters have indicated, uh, we could have huge surprises on election night. Uh, the threshold for a recognized party at the National Assembly is 12 seats or 20% of the vote. So what if no one gets 12 the, seats? Well, that's the thing. The Liberals aren't getting 20% of the vote. They may get 12 seats. They should get 12 seats. But Quebec Solidaire is having a better campaign. And Quebec Solidaire would need to have 13, 14 seats. And then suddenly it's a very close race for second place. And if there's a tie in the, in the seat count for second place, the official opposition goes to which party has the most votes. And that could be Quebec Solidaire. Well, what's very interesting is I've heard people analyze even this morning that they think as a result of the debate that Mr. Legault his popularity could like go down even to 36% perhaps after this. Well, you'll be the analyst of that when, when it all comes. To, but is that insane that like that would suggest 64% of the people <laughs> don't want him and yet he could come away with somewhere between 90 to 100 seats? Listen, uh, a win is a win. In, in 2018, uh, Monsieur Legault had 37% of vote right. and he had 74 seats. Now, if he gets 38, he could get 100 or 95 because the opposition is split. And so he's benefiting from a deeply split vote. Uh, it's insane, but that's the system that we've always had. And there doesn't seem to be much appetite to change it. Have there seen, there is some appetite. Have but you seen numbers like that before? Have you seen parties? Is, this, you know, is it repeating itself anywhere in the past? Uh, we have to go back to Robert Bourassa. In 85, he won 99 seats. Uh, but he won it with 55% of the vote. So, you know, it was a massive victory for Robert Bourassa. And then uh, 1973, I wasn't here. Uh, but 1973, uh, the Liberals won 102 seats. That's the record. I remember that. No. You remember that? It was I was five, I remember it well. Yeah, yeah exactly. You were, you were but minus what, five. Yeah. But yeah. what <laughs> happened for three years later, in 76, the Liberals lost because there was too much infighting and the Parti Québécois can what? So ah, infighting. Oh, so, uh, infighting. There's going to be a lot of that. Oh. So you talk about Quebec Solidaire maybe being the surprise here, actually being able to form the opposition in terms of more seats or a percentage of the vote. We were talking before we started about uh, the youth vote. 
Right. So overall, people are concerned there may not be enough people to turn out. We know what happened in Ontario during their provincial vote, 43% turnout, That's insane. historically low. Quebec Solidaire seems to have, if you want to call it, the youth vote locked up. But the problem has always been, yes, they can say they support a party, but no, they don't come out to vote. Do you see that being the case here? It's, it's entirely possible. And if you just play the odds, uh, you could say that it will happen again. Uh, the federal NDP is the same thing. They pull at 19. Now, next night, they have 17 uh, because they have the youth vote. So uh, the, the difference with Quebec Solidaire is even they know they're going to lose the election, but they have these pockets of supports. That could be really strong. And so if you're in, uh, I don't know, Matan Matepedia or Westmount, yeah, you Quebec say that you're not motivated to go to, to, to vote. But suddenly in Sherbrooke, in Abitibi, uh, maybe in places like Verdun, Verdun here in Montreal. Uh, so they have these the strategy of winning seats, not winning the most votes. And so when you have that strategy, the turnout could surprise a lot of people, I think. And you, you also mentioned that this has happened in the past where the youth vote, if it does turn out, can actually affect an election. Oh, yeah. I mean, when we break down the turnout in an election by age, we see that the older voters usually always show up in the same amount, 75, 80 percent, 85 percent. But when the general turnout goes down, it's because the youth vote did not show up. I mean, Mr. Harper in 2011 won a majority with the lowest uh, turnout in uh, recent history at the federal level. Uh, the, the youth did not show up. They showed up in 2015 for a, a young, uh, bright, uh, up-and-comer Justin Trudeau. Uh, and they, you know, Justin Trudeau hasn't been able to repeat that, and that's why he has failed to win another majority. Uh, I mean, if Quebec Solidaire gets his vote out to where it matters, they could win 14, 15 seats. So, stupid question, what's considered youth vote? What age and no, down? No. <laughs> yeah, like, is it 30 and down? Is it, well, you know, 20s? It, va it, varies. Uh, it varies. Usually it's students and young workers. In the polls, how they are split usually is 18 to 34, sometimes 34. 18 to 30. Okay. Uh, so young workers and students. Right, 34 year olds not going out to vote. Okay. You have, you have, you have seen uh, Monsieur Nadeau Dubois with his tiny little girl, baby girl, uh, you know, touring Quebec. He's trying to change the. He's, the, he's a father now. He's an adult now. He's trying to to shed this this, this view of him that many people have. That he's 18. Of, <laughs> yeah, that he has the square, right. the red square, and a right, fist right, in right, the right, air. Right. So uh, he's he's trying to bring Quebec Solidaire towards the mainstream. Right. The beard, too, helps. Do, do you not think, uh, as a lot of people have speculated, that if he dropped the separatist aspect of the party, that he would have had no trouble being not only second, but even being a bigger threat? The thing is, Bill, it's not his call. <laughs> that was decided in a convention, no, I a party agree. convention. But if they did that, I mean, we have several polls, massive amount of polling that shows that most QS voters are not don't don't consider themselves so, sovereignists. Right. Uh, it's close though. It's like usually 55, 45, or 40, 60. Uh, so could they win more, perhaps? But Certainly from an Anglo point. It's that's not true. holding them back. That's true. But the thing Anglo is, youth, it's like yeah. they have 15 priorities, and you know this is the 15th, 15th. Yeah. And so they, they're not they're not putting in your face like the Parti Québécois does. So for them, social justice. Uh, and I don't want to do their, their campaign here, but their, their, their message resonates a lot with young people. Right. And the fact that they would like Quebec to be a sovereign nation is far down the list. But it's still on the list. I find that fascinating because here we are in an election campaign, Philip, where separation wasn't on the ballot, right? No one's talking about <laughs> nope. it. It's not there anymore. Yet here we have three parties, for all intents and purposes, that have made separation part of their platform, including Eric Duhem who's famously locked the door but hasn't thrown away the key just to keep that door open. And even last night when Francois Legault was pressed, yeah. how would you vote in a referendum? So suddenly this is an issue, is it not? The thing is, the latest polling that we had on this uh, shows that still, to this day, 30% of Quebecers would vote yes if they could cast a vote for separation. And yet the PQ is at 10 or 11% in the polls. So that's why the PQ keeps talking about it. It's a, it's a winning issue for them. I mean, it, it antagonizes a lot of people, a majority of Quebecers. But you have an issue that's at 30% and your party's at 10. You jump on that. Um, and, you know, it, it will never go away. That's the thing. That is, for those who predicted the demise or the death right. of the Parti Québécois, right. we're making more of a wish than a, than a you know, fair prediction. It will never go away. It will have to be handled because there's a chunk of Quebecers that no matter what, they want Quebec to be a sovereign nation outside of Canada. And, you know, the Liberals won that fight against the PQ, and the PQ now may have a single seat. 
but they're bringing the Liberals with them. I mean, did you see the latest numbers for the Liberals? I mean, a dozen seats, all in Montreal, mostly in Anglo and Allophone communities. Uh, Francophone vote in the, for the Liberals is atrocious right now, single digits. So let me, let me bring up something else. This idea that um, polling in and of itself, so someone who analyzes polling. Let's get into it. Uh, a lot of people are, are saying, and I asked this question actually on, on my show a while ago, what about the idea of not even having polling at one oh. point beyond a certain point in an election campaign because yeah. it influences or could influence the vote? Oh, really? All right, let's get into I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. Bring it on. First, we have such a law at... 11.59 p.m., the day before an election, no polling. But we have that. Now, could it be earlier? We could. It's just that there are other effects. Whereas, I mean, the political parties were still poll. It's just that the law would be you, don't, you can't publish it. Right. That means that you can't publish information about the state of the race. And for those who say, yeah, the polls influence people, information influences you. This is information, and usually it's pretty good. Or, you know, when you, when you present it the way I do, with uncertainty, with variations, with noise, uh, always with, not a grain of salt, it's not the right word, but always with prudence, right? Uh, we have science in the streets, we have radio ads, TV ads, Facebook, everything in there right. is made to influence you. Right. The polls are just telling you the score of the game. If it's 3-1 for the Habs after two periods, they will play differently than if they're trailing 3-1. Yeah, but so, see, that's a really good analogy. And I yeah. would say if the score at the end of the first period was 5-1 for the Habs, yeah. some people might say, oh, this is over. I don't have to watch I'm anymore. Going home. In going this home. case, yeah. you look at a poll right. and you see one party so far ahead, yeah, you say, point. why should I even bother right, voting? Right, right. Well, I will tell you this. If you have a disaffected and disengaged electorate, which apparently we, have, we do, we have a bigger problem than the polls. Because, you know, not telling the people what the score is will not get them engaged. And so I think this is the wrong target. I mean, I know a lot of people, what you're just saying about polls, I know a lot of people think that. I, think, I just think it's misguided because political parties poll all the time. Why should they have the information not be available to the public? It's like hiding information from Fair. the public. And, um, you know, again, garbage polls exist. I'm here to filter them out. Usually I try to filter them out. Uh, they, they're bad because they have they bring bad information. I mean, a chocolate cake that is bad donely is also problematic. Uh, but a poll that I is agree. done rightly... <laughs> you, I know, I know. Absolutely. You would. <laughs> but a poll that is done correctly gives you information about the state of the race. I think this should be open to the public, not just those with deep but pockets. To your point about garbage polls, yeah. do you think the public sometimes can even tell the difference? They look at a poll just on I the surface. I do my surface. best, Aaron. That's what I do. I know you do. Yeah, yeah, but, but is it a concern? Right. It's a concern. When I started in 2016, I started after the uh, Clinton-Trump election because the polls were not that bad, yeah. but the analysis of the polls was horrendous. And it got me thinking, why don't we have something like this in Quebec and then in Canada? I mean, there's Eric Grenier with the CDC, uh, uh, then uh, now the, the red.ca, that does great work. I just felt, let's, let's... I read an article in the Journal of Montréal in 2016 that... Clearly, the journalists never understood what, what variations and fluctuations and the margin of the error. I mean, he just wrote the article about the poll without knowing any kind of statistics. You have to be careful with the numbers. And when I came in to do this, I felt, let's have a scientist eye look ah. at the data. Because you are a scientist. You are. Yes, You're that's right. An you astrophysicist. An astrophysicist. That's right. So I, if he, you lose the day job, uh, we, you got astrophysicists. I still, well, the, the day job is actually the Not astrophysicist. Bad. I, yeah. I know that. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Let but me ask you, how many polls are you actually looking at? Uh, so people all of them. Had, all like, of them. Uh, number wise, how, how many polls, like for example, in Quebec uh, for this election well, do you look at? Well, we have um, every other day a poll here and there, local polls, regional polls, Polls, national polls, provincial polls, number the federal, wise. Uh, number wise, I think there's been three leger, uh, so maybe a dozen plus the local polls. Wow. Yeah, so and it's going to get even crazier in the last week. For and sure. how accurate are you? Well, he's accurate because he <laughs> analyzed. He does a no, composite. No, that's a good. It's a fair question. For those who wonder, or listen to this. Wonder. There's the <laughs> entire record on my website. I show transparency, even my screw ups. Uh, it's my eleventh election. 
Okay. Uh, so the first 10 elections, I could pull up the numbers here, but I think it's 1,300 writings. I had the right winners in 90% of them. Wow, you, so. you could do horse racing too. I mean, it's, I, honestly, You'll have to discuss that personally. Yeah. That, yeah. I, I wanna, I'm more interested when you said now, over the course of the time you've done this, yeah. what are those screw ups? Which ones were the yes, worst? Tell us. Um, well, there was the, the, the no, Nova Scotia election, mm -hmm. was a screw up because I kept doing my projections and I kept waiting for posters to publish polls. And in the end, we had, had only two, a very yeah. small sample, and there was, it was a change election. And on the Sunday before the vote, I should have written to my readers over there. I don't have the data to, to, to do the projection. But I, didn't know, I wasn't sure, so I left it there. And I only had 65% of the writings uh, because the polls were so bad. Right. I mean, my nightmare is not that the polls are wrong. Night if the polls are wrong, no it's polls. not my fault. Uh, or if there are no polls, right. right. My nightmare is that the polls are correct and I screw up. And that hasn't happened yet. Right. The Corner Booth Podcast is brought to you in part by Guaranteed Industries. They are a Lennox premier dealer. They can take care of all your heating or cooling needs, residential, industrial, or commercial. GuaranteedIndustries.com or call them at 514-342-3400. They are a Lennox premier dealer. Let me ask you, um, another poll that's going to be even more interesting is the federal uh, between Mr. Yep. Pelyev and, and, and already I'm seeing numbers suggesting that... Uh, it's very much closer than people had anticipated. In a, in, a, in a sense that Monsieur Poiliev doesn't have a, a boost? No, that he has had a boost. Oh, he hasn't. No, not so far. No. Because according to one poll I saw that he, like, he had 28% and, uh, Trudeau, and Trudeau, was, Trudeau yeah. at 26 or 25%. Uh, the one you saw was the, probably the Leger one, had the Conservative at 34. And guess what they had in the last election? 34. And guess right. what they had in the previous election? 34. 30. But there was one that just so. came out on the basis of, uh, the, of uh, Poiliev uh, no. becoming Hey, there might be a little boost. Uh, usually new leaders do get a boost. And when you follow the curves over the years, a new leader gets a boost and then it subsides over time. How, how do you see this? Uh... Well, Mr. Poiliev is toxic for a lot of Canadians, yeah. he, but he will galvanize his base. They just have to hope that the base is enough because you know, the, conservative won, the conservatives at the federal level won the popular vote by one point in the previous two elections. Right. That's not enough because they run the score, they run up the score in, uh, in the prairies, in Alberta, in rural Ontario, and they win almost nothing in the suburbs and in Montreal, in, uh, in, in the cities. And Monsieur Poiliev has to win in the cities. And his message, uh, and especially surrounding what happened in Ottawa, the hostage crisis in Ottawa that we had last year with the convoy, uh, will that resonate in cities and suburbs? I'm not too sure. So not in Ottawa. Poiliev, Poiliev will do fine, uh, but those who say that we know for sure with the data right now, we don't. I have, too close. I have yeah. a question about the provincial election here. <laughs> right. What seats are you looking at right now that are keeping you up at night? Like, the what, what are the big... Uh, Fights, yeah. uh, there's, there are many that are keeping me up at night. Okay, uh, maybe not keeping you up. <laughs> no, but the, the, the three-way races are the hardest to call. Like Verdun. Uh, Verdun is one. I mean, the last time that Verdun was not liberal. I mean, the, the borders changed and the name of the writing changed. But the last time it was not liberal was 1936. Wow. So, wow. That's uh, a long time. And that 36 is the first win of Maurice 86 Blissi. years ago, oh my God. It's a long, long time. Good math. There have been some close calls for Verdun, but it's always been liberal since 1939, basically. And so when you have a seat that hasn't changed color in such a long time, and for me to go ahead and make a call and say, yeah, the liberals will lose it, I have to make damn sure of my data. Right, right, right. And so this this is an It's a keeping up in it, yes. Yeah, it is. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, it... it I expect, again, I expect to get 90% of the seats correctly. I would like it to, more, to be more, uh, but I understand there's a lot of uncertainty. We have partial data only. So again, I call always on caution for readers. Uh, we do not know how it's going to turn out. Otherwise, why would people vote, right, Aaron? Right. So. Any, exactly. any big Otherwise, upsets why would on the horizon? Vote? I mean, uh, well, right now, aren't they sort of suggesting that Quebec Solidaire is a little ahead? Uh, well, I'm su suggesting that. Uh, but you are? Yes. yes. Uh, it's just that, then again, the youth vote, if they don't get it out right. and they have 
30% of the vote instead of 33, that could make the difference between a win and a loss. So that would be the big upset in it this would be, election if, well, they, if they were the opposition. A seat that's been almost for a century for liberal and the liberal lose, I think that's an you, would, you would call that an upset. You know, we, we've been talking, we've had, say, Colin Standish, and we, yeah. we've spoken to him, we've yeah. talked to, to Balarama at one point. Um, a lot of people talked about the fact that these two new parties, even though they're regional, and I mean ultra-regional parties, yeah. Yeah. would end up splitting the vote. Do you buy that in writings that they're running? A in? little bit. I don't buy that because they do not have an organization worth of its name. Uh, it's, it's hard to find a new party with an organization. You have to get those emails, those postal codes, and they, in six months it's almost impossible to do. Uh, they've been good with the media. Been out there. I've seen Mr. Standish, well, if he's been with you, he's been on CTV, so he's been working the media. Uh, but uh, you know, it, since his party is has not come from a vacuum, if the Liberals right now were a strong second place and were competitive, uh, they would not have appeared. <laughs> they appeared because the Liberals are not competitive and probably, uh, you know, could lose uh, official party status. And so. Uh, you know, if I, I don't want to criticize Mr. Standish, he can do whatever he wants. You know, it's just that if I'm François Legault or if I'm uh, advising François Legault, I want to say, hey, Mr. Standish, do you, do you want some volunteers? I'll, I'll help you out. Because just a few hundred votes here and there could be the difference in this election for the Liberals. Wow. Uh, did they, are they splitting the vote? Well, if they have 2-3%, no. But if, if it takes a few hundred votes here and there, yeah, yeah maybe a few seats. Um, also, you know, I... I I, I don't think that's Mr. Standish's party. Uh, he's very serious. It's uh, you know it's uh, the Maxim Bernier's version of Quebec politics. It's you know he wants to have a protest vote. He wants to get funds, uh, tax deductible funds, to his party. I mean, but you know he can't he can't win since. The Corner Booth Podcast is brought to you in part by National Carpet. Beautiful designs and rugs from around the world. Classic and contemporary and design services available, plus full installation. National Carpet online, tapinational.com. I found it odd that you have these two parties, and I keep hearing the radio ads, for example, where instead of attacking the government, they're attacking the liberals. So they're attacking a different opposition party. Typically, you attack the party that's in power because that's what you're trying to make a statement against. They're attacking, if you want to call it the Anglo vote for the liberals, saying that they're the ones who let them down. That's kind of atypical in a campaign, isn't it? It's their well, only place they can go. <laughs> we, we've seen this in 89, the uh, Equality Party. It's, I mean, it's not unprecedented. Uh, but uh, then again, you start a party. You ha I mean, Monsieur Legault courted the Anglo's in 2012. I mean, he was even endorsed by the editorial board of the Gazette. So I'll uh, have to check that. No, <laughs> you, you, Let's you, look at the archives, this, right? Yeah. And so, when you want to build your party, you have to get the most votes to get more funding afterwards. That's the strategy. Monsieur Legault did that in 2012. He never really cared about the Anglo vote. He just wanted to have more votes to get more funding. And, it, and it's entirely fine. It's fine. You have to do this. Uh, but I, I think even in the... I mean, I'm not an Anglophone. You can hear it in my voice, right? I don't want to speak almost, for the Anglophone community. I, I know you guys will correct me, but I think <laughs> even in the Anglophone community in Montreal, there's a broad understanding and consensus. Yes, yeah, so and we're not all the same. We're not a model. No, not. That's why I say very broad, right? We're very broad. Very broad consensus that French, yes, indeed needs to be protected, even though the means to get there differ and there's the same agreement. And Mr. Standish goes right in there and you know, destroys that narrative. Uh, I don't think it's very uh, productive, but then again, if he gets votes, he can do whatever he wants. What about Durham? Because Durham also kind of <laughs> made advances towards the Anglophone community. Uh, and, and in the debates, he's the only one who kind of speaks up. Broke uh, into with, English? Yes. I feel the two solitudes here because, I mean, I feel that many Anglophones, and again, I say many, not most, right, and many, right, right. right? I feel like many Anglophones don't know the Eric Durham in radio. Is 15 yeah. years in radio. No, right. of all the You're things that he said. You're absolutely right about that. Yeah. And right. uh, so, yeah, two solitudes. But uh, he also came down. Wasn't there more of an expectation that he'd do better than he's doing right now? In the, you mean in uh, at the beginning of the election? Has he? Hi, no, he hasn't moved. He has plateaued huh? around 15 percent. That's what he's getting. I mean, uh, some polls have it a little higher, a little lower. 15, 16 percent. I thought Quebec City though was going to be. Quebec uh, City is uh, is is where oh, he's on the radio there all the time. Uh, this is where his most of his voters are found uh, in the in the suburbs of Quebec City. I have to say not the, the city itself. Uh, but the thing is, in Quebec City, 
The liberals are, are single digits. The liberals are done. The Charest Couillard years where the, the liberals did, did well in Quebec City, that's done. The Parti Québécois has been done for a long time. And so Monsieur Duhem and his conservatives are one-on-one -on -one against the CAQ. He cannot take advantage of a vote split, win with 33% of the vote. He has to win face-to-face -to -face against the CAQ. And so Monsieur Duhem, in his writing, or well, his writing, he, no, he's running where he's running. He cannot have 40% of the vote. He has to get 45 or 46 to right. win. How, many, win how many seats, though, do you think yes. you're going to end up Zero. with? Zero. Zero? Really, huh? Even his seat. Oh, I mean, the most likely seat is not his seat. It's, right. uh, it's Beausud. Yeah. Uh, Beausud, Beausnau. Uh, you know, it's a close race uh, between right. the CEQ and... I mean, it could be zero. It could be three. I would not surprise. My confidence interval right now, and that's more important than the prediction, it's the range. It's zero to five. Somewhere between zero and five. And on Glad for her seat? <laughs> She's not the favorite. Let's She's just say that. Favorite. Well, what's interesting about all of this is like when you see 16, 17 percent, all of them, what that translates to in seats is PQ maybe one seat, yeah. uh, Conservatives maybe one seat you're suggesting. Yeah. How many seats for Quebec Solidarity is it? Uh, 10, 12. And the Liberals? 15, 16. And so, like the vote, like the popularity thing means absolutely nothing. It means it means funding for your party because this, we still have in Quebec public funding, right. depending on the popular vote. That's why Zuem is courting the Anglo vote because he wants to get. Yeah, you know, right. Zuem is already looking for 2026. Ah. Can I go back and talk about the sure. island itself? Yep. So we just mentioned Dominic Anglade. We're here in her riding in Saint Henry. Right. Um, around the rest of the island. Do you see, based on the data that you've seen up until now, where are the upsets here? Huh. We're done. <laughs> well, uh, Anjou, Louis Riel, has been liberal since 98. It will probably flip to the CEQ. And then we have Verdun and Maurice Richard, two seats that were closer. Uh, Maurice Richard was really close in 2018. Uh, both liberals. Uh, the liberals will not win it. It's going to be the CEQ or Quebec City. With respect to Bill 96 that you just brought up, that right. does any of the polling show that that will still, is still obviously being held against the Liberals? Does that come up as an issue when people are asked about voting for them? Uh, I don't, do not have clear data on this. And there's also, I mean, when Bill 96 was adopted, of course, there was some polling about this. The thing is, have you read Bill 96? All 202 articles it, in it? No. It's, I also, it's also written in legalese, right? I've tried. I mean, I didn't read the whole thing, and I think we still discover stuff that is in there. According to index, index number two, yeah. blah, 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 it's just, so uh, if you I do a poll, do you agree with buying six people will go usually with their uh, partisan preferences, and so it doesn't teach you much. We have to be careful when we poll about, uh, when posters poll about issues, they have to be very specific. Uh, Bill 96 is too far and wide and, and strange. How, how much is this about the popularity of the party as opposed to the leader? How mu I mean, I don't want to blame Dominique Anglade, but is that a big issue that mm. she as a leader has not come through uh, with a lot of draw to the party? She, it was unfortunate for her that there was no race. And this is something that I know people... We don't know be, her or we don't... We don't know her. Yeah. And it's also, it's kind of, it's not her fault. But it is a little bit because she hasn't been able to connect, so it's, at some point it's on her. But the fact that she won by acclamation for me, I mean, nobody showed up. Right, nobody right. showed up. Had the, hadn't she showed up, the Liberals would be, what, leaderless? Or they would have found some... I mean, so, so I think a lot of people jumped ship from the Liberals because they knew the writer was on the wall for a while. Right. I mean, we've seen this since Confederation. The Liberals, sometimes they, they, they rule for a decade or so and they take a bad loss and they reconstruct. You have to have good draft picks and then you build from the, the goalie out, right? right. Uh, the Liberals are right there right now. They, they're not going to be in power for a long because time. Because I think if you compare her to a Valerie Plante, I, I, I'm comparing two <laughs> women, you're looking at somebody that people really voted for a, a certain character, charisma, a, a figurehead, whereas Plante seems, uh, whereas uh, Anglade seems more mysterious in a way of we don't see her personality as big as Plant, you know what I mean? That's a good point. I would say that Denis Coderre had something to do with uh, Valérie yeah. Plante's win. Uh, he was, uh, you know, terrible in those two elections. Uh, so, and Madame Adelad, she's take, she has taken a, a very rusty engine. I mean, the Liberals, you know, they had 15 straight years in sure. powers almost. The, the wear and tear of time does its toll on you. I mean, the Ontario Liberals next door also did had a great run. 
uh, and now it's just, you know, you go through the balloting box for a while. Uh, in this provincial election, what would constitute the biggest upset for you? If Eric Duhem elects multiple MAs, that would be a huge upset, and the CAQ will will have to protect its right flank. Uh, I think that's something to watch. And the Parti Québécois could win one seat, or they could win seven. And for the next four years, that's a huge difference. That's a dramatically different uh, National Assembly uh, in those two scenarios. It's, so. Sorry, is that Pascal Berube's seat? Pascal Berube's yes. safe. Okay. The others aren't. Monsieur Fournier, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thanks. Oh, it's been a pleasure, pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. That wraps up this edition of the Corner Booth Podcast. We'll see you next week. The Corner Booth Podcast is brought to you in part by Empire Gold. Paying the most for your collectibles. And remember, at Empire Gold, you get paid right on the spot. And nobody, but nobody pays more for your gold or silver than Empire. Online, empiregold.ca.